Chapters 9 and 10 of The Witness for the Defense by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 An Episode in Ballantine's Life. The Reptons lived upon the Kambala Hill, and the bow window of their drawing room looked down upon the Arabian Sea and southwards along the coast towards Malabar Point. In this embrasure, Mrs. Repton sat through a morning denying herself to her friends a book lay open on her lap but her eyes were on the sea a few minutes after the clock upon her mantelpiece had struck twelve she saw that for which she watched the bowsprit and the black bows of a big ship pushing out from under the hill and the water boiling under its stem the whole ship came into view with its awnings and its saffron funnels and headed to the northwest for aden Jane Repton rose up from her chair and watched it go. In the sunlight, its black hull was so sharply outlined on the sea, its lines and spars were so trim that it looked like a miniature ship which she could reach out her hand and snatch. But her eyes grew dim as she watched, so that it became shapeless and blurred, and long before the liner was out of sight, it was quite lost to her. I am foolish, she said, as she turned away, and she bit her handkerchief hard. This was midday of the Friday, and ever since that dinner party at the Carruthers on the Monday night, she had been alternating between wild hopes and arguments of prudence. But until this moment of disappointment, she had not realized how completely the hopes had gained the upper hand with her, and how extravagantly she had built upon Thresk's urgent questioning of her at the dinner-table. Very likely he never found the Ballantines at all, she argued. But he might have sent her word. All that morning she had been expecting a telephone message, or a telegram, or a note scribbled on board the steamer and sent up the Kambala Hill by a messenger. But not a token had come from him, and now, of the boat which was carrying him to England, there was nothing left but the stain of its smoke upon the sky. Mrs. Repton put her handkerchief in her pocket and was going about the business of her house when the butler opened the door. "'I am not in,' Mrs. Repton began, and cut short the sentence with a cry of welcome and surprise, for close upon the heels of the servant Thresk was standing. "'You!' she cried. "'Oh!' She felt her legs weakening under her, and she sat down abruptly on a chair. "'Thank heaven it was there,' she said. "'I should have sat on the floor if it hadn't been.' She dismissed the butler and held out her hand to Thresk. "'Oh, my friend,' she said, "'there's your steamer on its way to Aden.' Her voice rang with enthusiasm and admiration. Thresk only nodded his head gloomily. "'I have missed it,' he replied. "'It's very unfortunate. I have clients waiting for me in London.' "'You missed it on purpose,' she declared, and Thresk's face relaxed into a smile. He turned away from the window to her. He seemed suddenly to wear the look of a boy. "'I have the best of excuses,' he replied, "'the perfect excuse.' But even he could not foresee how completely that excuse was to serve him. "'Sit down,' said Jane Repton, "'and tell me. You went to Chitipur, I know.' From your presence here, I know, too, that you found them there? No, said Thresk, I didn't. He sat down and looked straight into Jane Repton's eyes. I had a stroke of luck. I found them in camp. Jane Repton understood all that the last two words implied. I should have wished that, she answered, if I had dared to think it possible. You talked with Stella? Hardly a word, but I saw. What did you see? I am here to tell you. And he told her the story of his night at the camp, so far as it concerned Stella Ballantyne, and indeed not quite all of that. For instance, he omitted altogether to relate how he had left his pipe behind him in the tent and had returned for it. That seemed to him unimportant. Nor did he tell her of his conversation with Ballantyne about the photograph. He was in a panic, he had delusions, he said, and left the matter there. Thresk had the lawyer's mind, or rather the mind of a lawyer in big practice. He had the instinct for the essential fact 
and the knowledge that it was most lucid when presented in a naked simplicity. He was at pains to set before Jane Repton what he had seen of the life which Stella lived with Stephen Ballantyne, and nothing else. Now, he said when he had finished, you sent me to Chitipur. I must know why. And when she hesitated, he overbore her. You can be guilty of no disloyalty to your friend, he insisted, by being frank with me. After all, I have given guarantees. I went to Chitipur upon your word. I have missed my boat. You bade me go to Chitipur. That told me too little or too much. I say, too little. I have got to know all now. And he rose up and stood before her. What do you know about Stephen Ballantyne? "'I'll tell you,' said Jane Repton. She looked at the clock. "'You had better stay and lunch with us, if you will. We shall be alone. I'll tell you afterwards. Meanwhile—' And in her turn she stood up. The sense of responsibility was heavy upon her. She had sent this man upon his errand of knowledge. He had done, in consequence of it, a stronger, a wilder thing than she had thought, than she had hoped for. She had a panicky feeling that she had set great forces at work. Meanwhile, asked Thresk, and she drew a breath of relief. The steadiness of his eyes and voice comforted her. His quiet insistence gave her courage. None of her troubles and doubts had any place, apparently, in his mind. A nervous horse in the hands of a real horseman. Thus she thought of herself in Thresk's presence. Meanwhile, I'll give you one reason why I wanted you to go. My husband's time in India is up. We are leaving for England altogether in a month's time. We shall not come back at all. And when we have gone, Stella will be left without one intimate friend in the whole country. Yes, said Thresk. That wouldn't do, would it? And they went into their luncheon. All through that meal, before the servants, they talked what is written in the newspapers. And of the two, she who had fears and hesitations was still the most impatient to get it done. She had her curiosity, and it was beginning to consume her. What had Thresk known of Stella, and she of him, before she had come out to India, and become Stella Ballantyne? Had they been in love? If not, why had Thresk gone to Chitipur? Why had he missed his boat and left all his clients over there in England in the lurch? If so, why hadn't they married? The idiots! Oh, how she wanted to know all the answers to all these questions! And what he proposed to do now! And she would know nothing unless she was frank herself. She had read his ultimatum in his face. "'We'll have coffee in my sitting-room. You can smoke there,' she said, and led the way to it. A cheroot? Thresk smiled with amusement, but the amusement annoyed her, for she did not understand it. "'I have got a Havana cigar here,' he said. "'May I?' "'Of course.' He lit it and listened, but it was not long before it went out, and he did not stir to light it again. The incident of which Mrs. Repton had been the witness, and which he related now, invested Ballantyne with horror. Thresk had left the camp at Chitipur with an angry contempt for him. The contempt passed out of his feelings altogether as he sat in Mrs. Repton's drawing-room. "'I am not telling you what Stella has confided to me,' said Mrs. Repton. "'Stella's loyal even when there's no cause for loyalty. And if loyalty didn't keep her mouth closed, self-respect would. I tell you what I saw. We were at Agra at the time. My husband was collector there. There was a durbar held, and the Rajah of Chitipur came to it with his elephants and his soldiers, and naturally Captain Ballantyne and his wife came too. They stayed with us. You are to understand that I know nothing, absolutely nothing, up to that time. I hadn't a suspicion until the afternoon of the finals in the polo tournament. Stella and I went together alone, and we came home about six. Stella went upstairs, and I, I walked into the library. She had found Ballantyne sitting in a high armchair, his eyes glittering under his black thick eyebrows, and his face livid. He looked at her as she entered, 
but he neither moved nor spoke, and she thought that he was ill. But the decanter of whisky stood empty on a little table at his side, and she noticed it. "'We have some people coming to dinner tonight, Captain Ballantyne,' she said. "'We shall dine at eight, so there's an hour and a half still.' She went over to a bookcase and took out a book. When she turned back into the room, a change had taken place in her visitor. Life had flickered into his face. His eyes were wary and cunning. "'And why did you tell me that?' he asked in a voice which was thick and formidable. She had a notion that he did not know who she was, and then suddenly she became afraid. She had discovered a secret, his secret. For once in the towns he had let himself go. She had a hope now that he could not move and that he knew it. He sat as still as his armchair. "'I had forgotten to tell you,' she replied. "'I thought you might like to know beforehand.' "'Why should I like to know beforehand?' She had his secret. He plied her with questions to know if she had it. She must hide her knowledge. Every instinct warned her to hide it. "'The people who are coming are strangers to India,' she said but I have told them of you, and they will come expectant. You are very kind. She had spoken lightly and with a laugh. Ballantyne replied without irony or amusement, and with his eyes fixed upon her face. Mrs. Repton could not account for the panic which seized hold upon her. She had dined in Captain Ballantyne's company before often enough. He had now been for three days in her house. She had recognized his ability, and had neither particularly liked nor disliked him. Her main impression had been that he was not good enough for Stella, and it was an impression purely feminine and instinctive. Now suddenly he had imposed himself upon her as a creature, dangerous, beast-like. She wanted to get out of the room, but she dared not, for she was sure that her careful steps would, despite herself, change into a run. She sat down, meaning to read for a few moments, compose herself, and then go. But no sooner had she taken her seat than her terror increased tenfold, for Ballantyne rose swiftly from his chair, and walking in a circle round the room with an extraordinarily light and noiseless step, disappeared behind her. Then he sat down. Mrs. Repton heard the slight grating of the legs of a chair upon the floor. It was a chair at a writing-table close by the window, and exactly at her back. He could see every movement which she made, and she could see nothing, not so much as the tip of one of his fingers. And of his fingers she was now afraid. He was watching her from his point of vantage. She seemed to feel his eyes burning upon the nape of her neck. And he said nothing. He did not stir. It was broad daylight, she assured herself. She had but to cross the room to the bell beside the fireplace. Nay, she had only to scream, and she was very near to screaming, to bring the servants to her rescue. But she dared not do it. Before she was halfway to the bell, before the cry was out of her mouth, she would feel his fingers close about her throat. Mrs. Repton had begun to tell her story with reluctance, dreading lest Thresk should attribute it to a woman's nerves and laugh but he did not. He listened gravely, seriously, and, as she continued, that nightmare of an evening so lived again in her recollections that she could not but make it vivid in her words. I had more than a mere sense of danger, she said. I felt besides a sort of hideous discomfort, almost physical discomfort, which made me believe that there was something evil in that room beyond the power of language to describe. She felt her self-control leaving her. If she stayed, she must betray her alarm. Even now she had swallowed again and again, and she wondered that he had not detected the working of her throat. She summoned what was left of her courage, and tossing her book aside, rose slowly and deliberately. "'I think I shall copy Stella's example and lie down for an hour,' she said, without turning her head towards Ballantyne and even while she spoke she knew that she had made a mistake in mentioning Stella. He would follow her to discover whether she went to Stella's room, and told what she had seen to her. But he did not move. She reached the door, turned the handle, 
went out and closed the door behind her. For a moment, then, her strength failed her. She leaned against the wall by the side of the door, her heart racing. But the fear that he would follow urged her on. She crossed the hall and stopped deliberately before a cabinet of china at the foot of the stairs, which stood against the wall in which the library door was placed. While she stood there, she saw the door open very slowly, and Ballantyne's livid face appear at the opening. She turned towards the stairs and mounted them without looking back. Halfway up a turn hid the hall from her, and the moment after she had passed the turn she heard him crossing the hall after her, again with a lightness of step which seemed to be uncanny and inhuman in so heavy and gross a creature. "'I was appalled,' she said to Thresk frankly. "'He had the step of an animal. I felt that some great baboon was tracking me stealthily.' Mrs. Repton came to Stella Ballantyne's door, and was careful not to stop. She reached her own room, and once in, shot the bolt, and in a moment or two she heard him breathing just outside the panels. "'And to think that Stella is alone with him in the jungle months at a time!' she cried, actually wringing her hands. "'That thought was in my mind all the time, a horror of a thought.' Oh, I could understand now the loss of her spirits, her colour, her youth. Pictures of lonely camps and empty rest-houses, far removed from any habitation in the silence of Indian nights, rose before her eyes. She imagined Stella propped up on her elbow in bed, wide-eyed with terror, listening and listening to the light footsteps of the drunken brute beyond the partition wall, shivered when they approached, dropping back with the dew of her sweat upon her forehead when they retired, and these pictures she translated in words for Thresk in her house on the Kambala Hill. Thresk was moved and showed that he was moved. He rose and walked to the window, turning his back to her. "'Why did she marry him?' he exclaimed. "'She was poor, but she had a little money. Why did she marry him?' and he turned back to Mrs. Repton for an answer. She gave him one quick look and said, "'That is one of the things she has never told me, and I didn't meet her until after she had married him.' "'And why doesn't she leave him?' Mrs. Repton held up her hands. "'Oh, the easy questions, Mr. Thresk. How many women endure the thing that is because it is?' Even to leave your husband you want a trifle of spirit. And what if your spirit's broken? What if you are cowed? What if you live in terror day and night? Yes, I am a fool, said Thresk, and he sat down again. There were two more questions I want to ask. Did you ever talk to Stella? The Christian name slipped naturally from him, and only Jane Repton of the two remarked that he had used it. Of that incident in the library at Agra? Yes. And did she, in consequence of what you told her, give you any account of her life with her husband? Mrs. Repton hesitated, not because she was any longer in doubt as to whether she would speak the whole truth or not. She had committed herself already too far. But because the form of the question nettled her. It was a little too forensic for her taste. She was anxious to know the man. She could dispense with the barrister altogether. "'Yes, she did,' she replied, "'and don't cross-examine me, please.' "'I beg your pardon,' said Thresk, with a laugh which made him human on the instant. "'Well, it's true,' said Jane Repton, in a rush. "'She told me the truth, what you know, and more. "'He stripped when he was drunk, stripped to the skin. "'Think of it. Stella told me that, and broke down. "'Oh, if you had seen her! "'For Stella to give way, that alone must alarm her friends.' Oh, but the look of her! She sat by my side on the sofa, wringing her hands, with the tears pouring down her face. Thresk rose quickly from his chair. Thank you, he said, cutting her short. He wanted to hear no more. He held out his hand to her with a certain abruptness. Mrs. Repton rose too. What are you going to do? she asked breathlessly. I must know. I have a right to, I think. I have told you so much. I was in great doubt whether I should tell you anything, but 
her voice broke and she ended her plea lamely enough i am very fond of stella i know that said thresk and his voice was grateful and his face most friendly well what are you going to do i am going to write to her to ask her to join me in bombay he replied end of chapter nine chapter ten news from chitipur a long silence followed upon his words jane repton turned to the mantel-shelf and moved an ornament here and another one there she had contemplated this very consequence of thresk's journey to chitipur she had actually worked for it herself she was frank enough to acknowledge that none the less his announcement quietly as he had made it was a shock to her she did not however go back upon her work and when she spoke it was rather to make sure that he was not going to act upon an unconsidered impulse it will damage your career she said of course you have thought of that it will alter it he answered if she comes to me i shall go out of parliament of course and your practice that will suffer too for a while no doubt but even if i lost it altogether i should not be a poor man you have saved money no there has not been much time for that but for a good many years now i have collected silver and miniatures i know something about them and the collection is of value i see mrs repton looked at him now oh yes he had thought his proposal out during the night journey to bombay not a doubt of it stella too will suffer she said worse than she does now asked thresk no but her position will be difficult for a while at least and she came towards thresk and pleaded you will be thoughtful of her for her oh if you should play her false how i should hate you and her eyes flashed fire at him i don't think you need fear that but he was too calm for her too quiet she was in the mood to want heroics she clamoured for protestations as a drug for her uneasy mind and thresk stood before her without one she searched his face with doubtful eyes oh there seemed to be no tenderness in it she will need love said mrs repton there that's the word can you give it her if she comes to me yes i have wanted her for eight years and then suddenly she got not heroics but a glimpse of a real passion a spasm of pain convulsed his face he sat down and beat with his fist upon the table it was horrible to me to ride away from that camp and leave her there miles away from any friend i would have torn her from him by force if there had been a single hope that way but his levies would have barred the road no this was the only chance to come away to bombay to write to her that the first day the first night she is able to slip out and travel here she will find me waiting mrs repton was satisfied but while he had been speaking a new fear had entered into her there's something i should have thought of she exclaimed yes captain ballantyne is not generous he is just the sort of man not to divorce his wife thresk raised his head clearly that possibility had no more occurred to him than it had to jane repton he thought it over now just the sort of man he agreed but we must take that risk if she comes the letter's not yet written mrs repton suggested but it will be he replied and then he stood and confronted her do you wish me not to write it she avoided his eyes she looked upon the floor she began more than one sentence of evasion but in the end she took both his hands in hers and said stoutly no i don't write write thank you he went to the door and when he had reached it she called to him in a low voice mr thresk what did you mean when you repeated and repeated if she comes thresk came slowly back into the room i meant that eight years ago i gave her a very good reason why she should put no faith in me he told her that quite frankly and simply but he told her no more than that and she let him go he went back to the great hotel on the apollo bund 
and sent off a number of cablegrams to London, saying that he had missed his steamer, and that the work waiting for him must go to other hands. The letter to Stella Ballantyne he kept to the last. It could not reach her immediately in any case, since she was in camp. For all he knew, it might be weeks before she read it, and he had need to go warily in the writing of it. Certain words she had used to him were an encouragement, but there were others which made him doubt whether she would have any faith in him. Every now and then there had been a savour of bitterness. Once she had been shamed because of him on Bigner Hill, where Stane Street runs to Chichester, and a second time in front of him in the tent at Chidipur. No, it was not an easy letter which he had to write, and he took the night and the greater part of the next day to decide upon its wording. It could not in any case go until the night mail. He had finished it and directed it by six o'clock in the evening, and he went down with the letter in his hand into the big lounge to post it in the box there. But it never was posted. Close to the foot of the staircase stood a tape machine, and as Fesk descended he heard the clicking of the instrument and saw the usual small group of visitors about it. They were mostly Americans, and they were reading out to one another the latest prices of the stock markets. Some of the chatter reached to Thresk's inattentive ears, and when he was only two steps from the floor, one carelessly spoken phrase, interjected between the values of two securities, brought him to a stop. The speaker was a young man with a squarish face and thick hair parted accurately in the middle. He was dressed in a thin grey suit, and he was passing the tape between his fingers as it ran out. The picture of him was impressed during that instant upon Thresk's mind, so that he could never afterwards forget it. "'Copper's up one point,' he was saying. "'That's fine.' "'Who's Captain Ballantyne, I wonder? "'United Steel has dropped seven-eighths. "'Well, that doesn't affect me.' And so he ran on. Thresk heard no more of what he said. He stood wondering what news could have come up on the tape of Captain Ballantyne, who was out in camp in the state of Chitipur, or if there was another Captain Ballantyne. He joined the little group in front of the machine, and picking up the ribbon from the floor, ran his eyes backwards along it until he came to United Steel. The sentence in front of that ran as follows. Captain Ballantyne was found dead early yesterday morning outside his tent close to Yarwal Junction. Thresk read the sentence twice, and then walked away. The news might be false, of course, but if it were true, here was a revolution in his life. There was no need for this letter which he held in his hand. The way was smoothed out for Stella, for him. Not for a moment could he pretend to do anything but welcome the news, to wish with all his heart that it was true. And it seemed probable news. There was the matter of that photograph. Thresk had carried it out to the governor's house on Malabar Point on the very morning of his arrival in Bombay. He had driven on to Mrs. Repton's house after he had left it there. But he had taken it away from Chitipur a too late a day to save Ballantyne. Ballantyne had, after all, had good cause to be afraid while he possessed it, and the news had not yet got to Salak's friends that it had left his possession. Thus he made out the history of Captain Ballantyne's death. The tape machine, however, might have ticked out a mere rumour with no truth in it at all. He went to the office and obtained a copy of The Advocate of India, the evening newspaper of the city. He looked at the stop-press telegrams. There was no mention of Ballantyne's death. Nor, on glancing down the columns, could he find in any paragraph a statement that any mishap had befallen him. But on the other hand he read that he himself, Henry Thresk, having brought his case to a successful conclusion, had left India yesterday by the mail steamer Madras, bound for Marseilles. He threw down the paper and went to the telephone box. If the news were true, the one person likely to know of it was Mrs. Repton. Thresk rang up the house on the Kambala Hill and asked to speak to her. An answer was returned to him at once that Mrs. Repton had given orders that she was not to be disturbed. Thresk, however, insisted 
Will you please give my name to her, Henry Thresk? And then he waited with his ear to the receiver for a century. At last a voice spoke to him, but it was again the voice of the servant. The Mem Sahib, very sorry, sir, but cannot speak to any one just now. And he heard the jar of the instrument as the receiver at the other end was sharply hung up and the connection broken. Thresk came out from the telephone box with a face puzzled and very grave. Mrs. Repton refused to speak to him. It was a fact, an inexplicable fact, and it alarmed him. It was impossible to believe that mere reflection during the last twenty-four hours had brought about so complete a revolution in her feelings. He to whom she had passionately cried, Right, right, only yesterday, could hardly be barred out from mere speech with her to-day for any fault of his. He had done nothing, had seen no one. Thresk was certain now that the news upon the tape was true, but it could not be all the truth. There was something behind it, something rather grim and terrible. Thresk walked to the door of the hotel and called up a motor-car. "'Tell him to drive to the Kambala Hill,' he said to the porter. "'I'll let him know when to stop.' The porter translated the order, and Thresk stopped at Mrs. Repton's door. "'The Mem Sahib does not receive any one to-day,' said the butler. "'I know,' replied Thresk. He scribbled on a card and sent it in. There was a long delay. Thresk stood in the hall, looking out through the open door. Night had come. There were lights upon the roadway, lights a long way below at the water's edge, on breech candy, and there was a light twinkling far out on the Arabian Sea. But the house behind him all was dark. He had come to an abode of desolation and mourning, and his heart sank, and he was attacked with forebodings. At last in the passage behind him there was a shuffling of feet and a gleam of white. The Mem Sahib would receive him. Thresk was shown into the drawing-room. That room, too, was unlit. But the blinds had not been lowered, and light from a street lamp outside turned the darkness into twilight. No one came forward to greet him, but the room was not empty. He saw Repton and his wife huddled close together on a sofa in a recess by the fireplace. "'I thought that I had better come up from Bombay,' said Thresk, as he stood in the middle of the room. No answer was returned to him for a few moments, and then it was Repton himself who spoke. "'Yes, yes,' he said, and he got up from the sofa. "'I think we had better have some light,' he added, in a strange, indifferent voice. He turned the light on in the central chandelier, leaving the corners of the room in shadow, like the parallel forced its way into Thresk's mind, like the tent in Chitipur. Then very methodically he pulled down the blinds. He did not look at Thresk, and Jane Repton on the couch never stirred. Thresk's forebodings became a dreadful certainty. Some evil thing had happened. He might have been in a house of death. He knew that he was not wanted there, that husband and wife wished to be alone, and silently resented his presence. But he could not go without more knowledge than he had. A message came up on the tape half an hour ago, he said in a low voice. It reported that Ballantyne was dead. Yes, replied Repton. He was leaning forward over a table, and looking up to the chandelier, as if he fancied that its light burned more dimly than usual. That's true, and he spoke in the same strange mechanical voice he had used before that he was found dead outside his tent thresk added it's quite true repton agreed we are very sorry sorry the exclamation burst from thresk's lips yes repton moved away from the chandelier he had not looked at thresk once since he had entered the room nor did he look towards his wife his face was very pale and he was busy now, setting a chair in place, moving a photograph, doing any one of the little unnecessary things people restlessly do when there is an importunate visitor in the room who will not go. You see, there's terribly bad news, he added. What news? He was shot, you know, 
That wasn't in the telegram on the tape, of course. Yes, he was shot, on the same night you dined there, after you had gone. Shot? Thresk's voice dropped to a whisper. Yes, and the dull, quiet voice went on, speaking apparently of some trivial affair in which none of them could have any interest. He was shot by a bullet from a little rook rifle which belonged to Stella, and which she was in the habit of using. Thresk's heart stood still. A picture flashed before his eyes. He saw the inside of that dimly lit tent with its red lining, and Stella standing by the table. He could hear her voice. This is my little rook rifle. I was seeing that it was clean for tomorrow. She had spoken so carelessly, so indifferently, that it wasn't conceivable that what was in all their minds could be true. Yet she had spoken, after all, no more indifferently than Repton was speaking now, and he was in a great stress of grief. Then Thresk's mind leaped to the weak point in all this chain of presumption. But Ballantyne was found outside the tent, he cried with a little note of triumph but it had no echo in Repton's reply. I know. That makes everything so much worse. What do you mean? Ballantyne was found in the morning outside the tent stone cold, but no one had heard the shot, and there were sentries on the edge of the encampment. He had been dragged outside after he was dead, or when he was dying. A low cry broke from Thresk. The weak point became of a sudden the most deadly, the most terrible element in the whole case. He could hear the prosecuting counsel making play with it. He stood for a moment lost in horror. Repton had no further word to say to him. Mrs. Repton had never once spoken. They wanted him away, out of the room, out of the house. Some insight let him into the meaning of her silence. In the presence of this tragedy, remorse had gripped her. She was looking upon herself as one who had plotted harm for Stella. She would never forgive Thresk for his share in the plot. Thresk went out of the room without a word more to either Repton or his wife. Whatever he did now he must do by himself. He would not be admitted into that house again. He closed the door of the room behind him, and hardly had he closed it when he heard the snap of a switch and the line of light under the door vanished. Once more there was darkness in the drawing-room. Repton, no doubt, had returned to his wife's side, and they were huddled again, side by side, on the sofa. Thresk walked down the hill with a horrible feeling of isolation and loneliness. But he shook it off as he neared the lights of Bombay. End of chapter 10 Chapters 11 and 12 of The Witness for the Defense by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11. Thresk Intervenes. Thresk reached his hotel with some words ringing in his head which Jane Repton had spoken to him at Mrs. Carruthers' dinner party. You can get any single thing in life you want if you want it enough but you cannot control the price you will have to pay for it. That you will only learn afterwards and gradually. He had got what he wanted, the career of distinction, and he wondered whether he was to begin now to learn its price. He mounted to his sitting-room on the second floor, avoiding the lounge and the lift and using a small side staircase instead of the great central one. He had passed no one on his way. In his room he looked upon the mantel-shelf and on the table. No visitor had called on him that day, no letter awaited him. For the first time since he had landed in India, a day had passed without some resident leaving on him a card or a note of invitation. The newspapers gave him the reason. He was supposed to have left on the Madras for England. To make sure he rang for his waiter. No message of any kind has come. "'Shall I ask at the office?' the waiter asked. "'By no means,' answered Thresk, and he added, "'I will have dinner served up here to-night. 
There was just a possibility, he thought, that he might, after all, escape this particular payment. He took from his pocket his unposted letter to Stella Ballantyne. There was no longer any use for it, and even its existence was now dangerous to Stella. For let it be discovered, however she might plead that she knew nothing of its contents, a motive for the death of Ballantyne might be inferred from it. It would be a false motive, but just the sort of motive which the man in the street would immediately accept. Thresk burnt the letter carefully in a plate, and pounded up each black flake of paper until nothing was left but ashes. Then for the moment his work was done. He had only to wait, and he did not wait long. On the very next morning his newspaper informed him that Inspector Colson of the Bombay Police had left for Chitipur. The inspector was a young man devoted to his work, but he travelled now upon a duty which he would gladly have handed to any other of his colleagues. He had met Stella Ballantyne in Bombay upon one of her rare visits to Jane Repton. He had sat at the same dinner-table with her, and he did not find it pleasant to reflect on the tragic destiny which he must now fulfil, for the facts were fatal. At daybreak, on the morning of Friday, a sentry on the outer edge of the camp at Yarwal Junction had noticed something black lying upon the ground in the open just outside the door of the agent's big marquee. He ran across the ground and discovered Captain Ballantyne sprawling, face downwards, in the smoking suit which he had worn at dinner the night before. The sentry shook him gently by the shoulder, but the limpness of the body frightened him. Then he noticed that there was blood upon the ground, and calling loudly for help he ran to the guard-room tent. He returned with others of the native levies, and they lifted Ballantyne up. He was dead, and the body was cold. The levies carried him into the tent and opened his shirt. He had been shot through the heart. They then roused Mrs. Ballantyne's ayah, and bade her wake her mistress. The ayah went into Mrs. Ballantyne's room, and found her mistress sound asleep. She waked her up and told her what had happened. Stella Ballantyne said not a word. She got out of bed, and flinging on some clothes, went into the outer tent, where the servants were standing about the body. Stella Ballantyne went quite close to it, and looked down upon the dead man's face for a long time. She was pale, but there was no shrinking in her attitude, no apprehension in her eyes. He has been killed, she said at length. Telegrams must be sent at once. To Aimere for a doctor, to Bombay, and to His Highness the Maharaja. Baram Singh salaamed. It is as Your Excellency wills, he said. I will write them, said Stella quietly. And she sat down at her own writing table there and then. The doctor from Aimere arrived during the day made an examination and telegraphed a report to the chief commissioner at Aimere. That report contained the three significant points which Repton had enumerated to Thresk, but with some still more significant details. The bullet which pierced Captain Ballantyne's heart had been fired from Mrs. Ballantyne's small rook rifle, and the exploded cartridge was still in the breech. The rifle was standing up against Mrs. Ballantyne's writing-table in a corner of the tent when the doctor from Aimere discovered it. In the second place, although Ballantyne was found in the open, there was a patch of blood upon the carpet within the tent, and a trail of blood from that spot to the door. There could be no doubt that Ballantyne was killed inside. There was the third point to establish that theory. Neither the sentry on guard nor any one of the servants sleeping in the adjacent tents had heard the crack of the rifle. It would not be loud in any case, but if the weapon had been fired in the open, it would have been sufficiently sharp and clear to attract the attention of the men on guard. The heavy double lining of the tent, however, was thick enough so to muffle and deaden the sound that it would pass unnoticed. The report was considered at Aimere, and forwarded. It now brought Inspector Colson of the police up the railway from Bombay. He found Mrs. Ballantyne waiting for him at the residency of Chitipur. 
"'I must tell you who I am,' he said awkwardly. "'There is no need to,' she answered. "'I know.' He then cautioned her in the usual way, and producing his pocket-book asked her whether she wished to throw any light upon her husband's death. "'No,' she said. "'I have nothing to say. I was asleep and in bed when my ayah came into my room with the news of his death.' "'Yes,' said the inspector uncomfortably. That detail, next to the dragging of the body out of the tent, seemed to him the grimmest part of the whole tragedy. He shut up his book. "'I am afraid it is all very unsatisfactory,' he said. "'I think we must go back to Bombay.' "'It is as Your Excellency wills,' said Stella in Hindustani, and the inspector was startled by the bad taste of the joke. He had not the knowledge of her life with Ballantyne, which alone would have given him the key to understand her. But he was not a fool, and a second glance at her showed to him that she was not speaking in joke at all. He had an impression that she was so tired that she did not at the moment care what happened to her at all. The fatigue would wear off, no doubt, when she realized that she must fight for her life. But now she stood in front of him indifferent and docile, much as one of the native levies was wont to stand before her husband. The words which the levies used and the language in which they spoke them rose naturally to her lips as the only words and language suitable to the occasion. "'You see, Mrs. Ballantyne,' he said gently, "'there is no reason to suspect a single one of your servants or of your escort.' "'And there is reason to suspect me,' she added, looking at him quietly and steadily. The inspector, for his part, looked away. He was a young man, no more than a year or two older than Stella Ballantyne herself. They both came from the same kind of stock. Her people and his people might have been friends in some pleasant country village, in one of the English counties. She was pretty, too, disconcertingly pretty, in spite of the dark circles under her eyes and the pallor of her face. There was a delicacy in her looks and in her dress which appealed to him for tenderness. The appeal was all the stronger, because it was only in that way and unconsciously that she appealed. In her voice, in her bearing, in her eyes, there was no request, no prayer. "'I have been to the palace,' he said. "'I have had an audience with the Maharaja.' "'Of course,' she answered. "'I shall put no difficulties in your way.' He was standing in her own drawing-room, noticing with what skill comfort had been combined with daintiness, and how she had followed the usual instinct of her kind in trying to create there in this room a piece of England. Through the window he looked out upon a lawn which was being watered by a garden sprinkler, and where a gardener was at work attending to a bed of bright flowers. There, too, she had been making the usual pathetic attempt to convert a half-acre of this country of yellow desert into a green garden of England. Colson had not a shadow of a doubt in his mind that Stella Ballantyne would exchange this room with its restful colours and its outlook on a green lawn for, at the best, many years of solitary imprisonment in Poona jail. He shut up his book with a snap. "'Will you be ready to go in an hour?' he asked roughly. "'Yes,' said she. "'If I leave you unwatched during that hour, "'you will promise to me that you will be ready to go in an hour?' "'Stella Ballantyne nodded her head. "'I shall not kill myself now,' she said. "'And he looked at her quickly, "'but she did not trouble to explain her words. "'She merely added, "'I may take some clothes, I suppose?' "'Whatever you need,' said the inspector, "'and he took her down to Bombay.' She was formally charged next morning before the stipendiary for the murder of her husband and remanded for a week. She was remanded at eleven o'clock in the morning, and five minutes later the news was ticked off on the tape at the Taj Mahal Hotel. Within another five minutes the news was brought upstairs to Thresk. He had been fortunate. He was in a huge hotel where people flit through its rooms for a day and are gone the next and no one is concerned with the doings of his neighbour, a place of arrival and departure like the platform of a great railway station. 
There was no place in all Bombay where Thresk could so easily pass unnoticed. And he had passed unnoticed. A single inquiry at the office, it is true, would have revealed his presence. But no one had inquired, since by this time he should be nearing Aden. He had kept to his rooms during the day, and had only taken the air after it was dark. This was in the early stages of wireless telegraphy, and the Madras had no installation. It might be that inquiries should be made for him at Aden. He could only wait with Jane Repton's words ringing in his ears, You cannot control the price you will have to pay. Stella Ballantyne was brought up again in a week's time, and the case then proceeded from day to day. The character of Ballantyne was revealed, his brutalities, his cunning. Detail by detail he was built up into a gross, sinister figure, secret and violent, which lived again in that crowded court, and turned the eyes of the spectators with a shiver of discomfort upon the young and quiet woman in the dock. And in that character the prosecution found the motive of the crime. Sympathy at times ran high for Stella Ballantyne, but there were always the two grim details to keep it in check. She had been found asleep by her ayah, quietly, restfully asleep within a few hours of Ballantyne's death, and she had, according to the theory of the Crown, found in some violence of passion the strength to drag the dying man from the tent and to leave him to gasp out his life under the stars. Thresk watched the case from his rooms at the Taj Mahal Hotel. Every fact which was calculated to arouse sympathy for her was also helping to condemn her. No one doubted that she had shot Stephen Ballantyne. He deserved shooting very well. But that did not give her the right to be his executioner. What was her defence to be? A sudden intolerable provocation? How could that square with the dragging of his body across the carpet to the door? There was the fatal, insuperable act. Thresk read again and again the reports of the proceedings for a hint as to the line of the defence. He got it the day when Repton appeared in the witness-box on a subpoena from the Crown to bear testimony to the violence of Stephen Ballantyne. He had seen Stella with her wrist bruised, so that in public she could not remove her gloves. "'What kind of bruises?' asked the counsel. "'Such bruises as might be made by someone twisting her arms,' he answered. And then Mr. Travers, a young barrister, who was enjoying his first leap into the public eye, rose to cross-examine. Thresk read through that cross-examination, and rose to his feet. You cannot control the price you will have to pay, he said to himself. That day, when Mrs. Ballantyne's solicitor returned to his office after the rising of the court, he found Thresk waiting for him. I wish to give evidence for Mrs. Ballantyne, said Thresk, evidence which will acquit her. He spoke with so much certainty that the solicitor was fairly startled. And with evidence so positive in your possession, it is only this afternoon that you come here with it? Why? Thresk was prepared for the question. I have a great deal of work waiting for me in London, he returned. I hoped that it might not be necessary for me to appear at all. Now I see that it is. The solicitor looked straight at Thresk. I knew from Mrs. Repton that you dined with the Ballantines that night but she was sure that you knew nothing of the affair. You had left the tent before it happened. That is true, answered Thresk. Yet you have the evidence which will acquit Mrs. Ballantyne? I think so. How is it, then, the lawyer asked, that we have heard nothing of this evidence at all from Mrs. Ballantyne herself? Because she knows nothing of it, replied Thresk. The lawyer pointed to a chair. The two men sat down together in the office, and it was long before they parted. Within an hour of Thresk's return from the solicitor's office, an inspector of police waited on him at his hotel, and was instantly shown up. "'We did not know until today,' he said, "'that you were still in Bombay, Mr. Thresk. We believed you to be on the Madras, which reached Marseille early this morning.' 
I missed it, replied Thresk. Had you wanted me, you could have inquired at Port Said five days ago. Five days ago we had no information. The native servants of Ballantyne had from the first shrouded themselves in ignorance. They would answer what questions were put to them. They would not go one inch beyond. The crime was an affair of the sahibs, and the less they had to do with it the better, until at all events they were sure which way the wind was setting from Government House. Of their own initiative they knew nothing. It was thus only by the discovery of Thresk's letter to Captain Ballantyne, which was found crumpled up in a waste-paper basket, that his presence that night in the tent was suspected. "'It is strange,' the inspector grumbled, "'that you did not come to us of your own accord "'when you had missed your boat and tell us what you knew.' "'I don't think it is strange at all,' answered Thresk, "'for I am a witness for the defence. "'I shall give my evidence when the case for the defence opens.' "'The inspector was disconcerted and went away. "'Thresk's policy had so far succeeded, "'but he had taken a great risk,' and now that it was past he realized with an intense relief how serious the risk had been if the inspector had called upon him before he had made known his presence to mrs ballantyne's solicitor and offered his evidence his position would have been difficult he would have had to discover some other good reason why he had lain quietly at his hotel during these last days but fortune had favoured him he had to thank above all the secrecy of the native servants end of chapter 11 chapter 12 thresk gives evidence thresk's fears were justified sympathy for stella ballantyne had already begun to wane the fact that ballantyne had been found outside the door of the tent was already assuming a sinister importance mrs ballantyne's counsel slid discreetly over that awkward incident very fortunately, as it was now to prove, he did not cross-examine the doctor from Imeri at all. But there were always the few who opposed the general opinion, the men and women who are in the minority because it is the minority, those whom the hysterical glorification made of Stella Ballantyne had offended, the austere, the pedantic, the just, the jealous, all were quick to seize upon this disconcerting fact stella ballantyne had dragged her dying husband from the tent it was either sheer callousness or blind fury you might take your choice in either case it dulled the glow of martyrdom which for a week or two had been so radiant upon stella ballantyne's forehead and the few who argued thus attracted adherents daily and with the sympathy for stella ballantyne interest in the case began to wane too the magisterial inquiry threatened to become tedious. The pictures of the witnesses and the principals occupied less and less space in the newspapers. In another week the case would be coldly left with a shrug of the shoulders to the law courts. But unexpectedly curiosity was stirred again, for the day after Thresk had called upon the lawyer, when the case for the Crown was at an end, Mrs. Ballantyne's counsel, Mr. Travers, asked permission to recall Baram Singh. Permission was granted, and Baram Singh once more took his place in the witness-box. Mr. Travers leaned against the desk behind him, and put his questions with the most significant slowness. "'I wish to ask you, Baram Singh,' he said, "'about the dinner-table on the Thursday night. You laid it?' "'Yes,' replied Baram Singh. "'For how many?' "'For three. There was a movement through the whole court. Yes, said Mr. Travers, Captain Ballantyne had a visitor that night. Baram Singh agreed. Look round the court and tell the magistrate if you can see here the man who dined with Captain Ballantyne and his wife that night. For a moment the court was filled with the noise of murmuring. The usher cried, Silence! and the murmuring ceased. A hush of expectation filled that crowded room as Bahram Singh's eyes travelled slowly round the walls. He dropped them to the well of the court, and even his unexpressive face flashed with a look of recognition. "'There!' he cried, "'there!' and he pointed to a man who was sitting just underneath the council's bench. Mr. Travers leaned forward, 
and in a quiet but particularly clear voice said will you kindly stand up mr thresk thresk stood up to many of those present the idlers the people of fashion the seekers after a thrill of excitement who filled the public galleries and law courts his long conduct of the great carruthers trial had made him a familiar figure to others his name at all events was known and as he stood up on the floor of the court a swift and regular movement like a ripple of water passed through the throng they leaned forward to get a clearer view of him and for a moment there was a hiss of excited whispering that is the man who dined with captain and mrs ballantyne on the night when captain ballantyne was killed said mr travers yes replied baram singh no one understood what was coming people began to ask themselves whether thresk was concerned in the murder word had been published that he had already left for england how was it he was here now mr travers for his part was enjoying to the full the suspense which his question had aroused not by any intonation did he allow a hint to escape him whether he looked upon thresk as an enemy or friend you may sit down sir now he said and thresk resumed his seat will you tell us what you know of mr thresk's visit to the captain travers resumed and baram singh told how a camel had been sent to the dock house by the station of yarwal junction yes said mr travers and he dined in the tent how long did he stay he left the camp at eleven o'clock on the camel to catch the night train to bombay the captain sahib saw him off from the edge of the camp ah said mr travers captain ballantyne saw him off yes from the edge of the camp and then went back to the tent yes now i want to take you to another point you waited at dinner yes and towards the close of dinner mrs ballantyne left the room yes she did not come back again no no the two men were then left alone yes after dinner was the table cleared yes said baram singh the captain sahib called to me to clear the table quickly yes said travers now will you tell me what the captain sahib was doing while you were clearing the table baram singh reflected first of all the captain sahib offered a box of cheroots to his visitor and his visitor refused and took a pipe from his pocket the captain sahib then lit a cheroot for himself and replaced the box on the top of the bureau and after that asked travers after that said baram singh he stooped down unlocked the bottom drawer of his bureau and then turned sharply to me and told me to hurry and get out and that order you obeyed yes now baram singh did you enter the room again baram singh explained that after he had gone with the tablecloth he returned in a few moments with an ashtray which he placed beside the visitor sahib yes said travers had captain ballantyne altered his position baram singh then related that captain ballantyne was still sitting in his chair by the bureau but that the drawer of the bureau was now open and that on the ground close to captain ballantyne's feet there was a red dispatch box the captain sahib he continued turned to me with great anger and drove me again out of the room thank you said mr travers and he sat down the prosecuting counsel rose at once now baram singh he said with severity why did you not mention when you were first put in the witness box that this gentleman was present in the camp that night i was not asked no that is quite true he continued you were not asked specifically but you were asked to tell all that you knew i did not interfere replied baram singh i answered what questions were asked besides when the sahib left the camp the captain sahib was alive at this moment mr travers leaned across to the prosecuting counsel and said it will be all made clear when mr thresk goes into the box and once more as mr travers spoke these words a rustle of expectancy ran round the court travers opened the case for the defence on the following morning he had been originally instructed he declared to reserve the defence 
for the actual trial before the jury but upon his own urgent advice that plan was not to be followed the case which he had to put before the stipendiary must so infallibly prove that mrs ballantyne was free from all complicity in this crime that he felt he would not be doing his duty to her unless he made it public at the first opportunity that unhappy lady had already as every one who had paid even the most careless attention to the facts that had been presented by the prosecution must know suffered so much distress and sorrow in the course of her married life that he felt it would not be fair to add to it the strain and suspense which even the most innocent must suffer when sent for trial upon such a serious charge he at once proposed to call mr thresk and thresk rose and went into the witness-box thresk told the story of that dinner-party word for word as it had occurred laying some emphasis on the terror which from time to time had taken possession of stephen ballantyne down to the moment when baram singh had brought the ash-tray and left the two men together thresk sitting by the table in the middle of the room and ballantyne at his bureau with the dispatch-box on the floor at his feet then i noticed an extraordinary look of fear disfigure his face he continued and following the direction of his eyes i saw a lean brown arm with a thin hand as delicate as a woman's wriggle forward from beneath the wall of the tent towards the dispatch-box you saw that quite clearly asked mr travers the tent was not very brightly lit thresk explained at the first glance i saw something moving i was inclined to believe it a snake and to account in that way for captain ballantyne's fear and the sudden rigidity of his attitude but i looked again and i was then quite sure that it was an arm and hand the evidence roused those present to such a tension of excitement and to so loud a burst of murmuring that it was quite a minute before order was restored and thresk took up his tale again he described ballantyne's search for the thief and what were you doing mr travers asked whilst the search was being made i stood by the table holding the dispatch-box firmly in my hands as ballantyne had urgently asked me to do quite so said mr travers and the attention of the court was now directed to that dispatch-box and the portrait of bahadur salak which it contained the history of the photograph its importance at this moment when salak's trial impended and ballantyne's conviction of the extreme danger which its possessor ran a conviction established by the bold attempt to steal it made under their very eyes was laid before the stipendiary he sent the case to trial as he was bound to do but the verdict in most people's eyes was a foregone conclusion thresk had supplied a story which accounted for the crime and cross-examination could not shake him it was easy to believe that at the very moment when thresk was saying good-bye to captain ballantyne by the fire on the edge of the camp the thief slipped into the marquee and when discovered by ballantyne either on his return or later shot him with mrs ballantyne's rifle it was clear that no conviction could be obtained while this story held the field and in due course mrs ballantyne was acquitted of thresk's return to the tent just before leaving the camp nothing was said thresk himself did not mention it and the counsel for the crown had no hint which could help him to elicit it thus the case ended the popular heroine of a criminal trial loses as all observers will have noticed her crown of romance the moment she is set free and that good fortune awaited stella ballantyne thresk called the next day upon jane repton and was coldly told that stella had already gone from bombay he betook himself to her solicitor who was cordial but uncommunicative the Reptons, it appeared, were responsible to him for the conduct of the case. He had not any knowledge of Stella Ballantyne's destination, and he pointed to a stack of telegrams and letters as confirmation of his words. "'They will all go up to Kambala Hill,' he said. "'I have no other address.' The next day, however, a little note of gratitude came to Thresk through the post.' 
It was unsigned and without any address. But it was in Stella Ballantyne's handwriting, and the postmark was Kurachi. That she did not wish to see him he could quite understand. Kurachi was a port from which ships sailed to many destinations. He could hardly set out in a blind search for her across the world. So here, it seemed, was that chapter closed. He took the next steamer westwards from Bombay, landed at Brindisi, and went back to his work in the law courts and in Parliament. End of chapter 12《Chapters 13 and 14 of The Witness for the Defense by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 Little Beading Again. But though she disappeared, Stella Ballantyne was not in flight from men and women. She avoided them because they did not for the moment count in her thoughts, except as possible hindrances. She was not so much running away as running to the place of her desires. She yielded to an impulse with which they had nothing whatever to do, an impulse so overmastering that even to the reptants her precipitancy wore a look of ingratitude. She drove home with Jane Repton as soon as she was released to the house on Kambala Hill, and while she was still in the carriage she said, "'I must go away to-morrow morning.' She was sitting forward with a tense and eager look upon her face, and her hands clenched tightly in her lap. "'There's no need for that. Make your home with us, Stella, for a little while, and hold your head high.' Jane Repton had talked over this proposal with her husband. Both of them recognized that the acceptance of it would entail on them some little sacrifice. Prejudice would be difficult but they had thrust these considerations aside in the loyalty of their friendship, and Jane Repton was a little hurt that Stella waved away their invitation without ceremony. "'I can't, I can't,' she said irritably. "'Don't try to stop me.' Her nerves were quite on edge, and she spoke with a greater violence than she knew. Jane Repton tried to persuade her. "'Wouldn't it be wiser for you to face things here?' even though it means some effort and pain i don't know answered stella still in the quick peremptory tone of one who will not be argued with i don't care either i have nothing to do with wisdom just now i don't want people at all i want oh how i want she stopped and then she added vaguely something else and her voice trailed away into silence she sat without a word, all tingling impatience, during the rest of that drive, and continued so to sit after the carriage had stopped. When Jane Repton descended, and she woke up with a start and looked at the house, it was as though she had brought her eyes down from heaven to earth. Once within the house, she went straight up to Repton. He had left his wife behind with Stella at the law courts, and had come home in advance of them. He had not spoken a word to Stella that day, and he had not the time now, for she began immediately in an eager voice and a look of fever in her eyes. "'You won't try to stop me, will you? I must go away to-morrow.' Repton used more tact now than his wife had done. He took the troubled and excited woman's hand, and answered her very gently. "'Of course, Stella. You shall go when you like.' "'Oh, thank you!' she cried, and was free to remember the debt which she owed to these good friends of hers. "'You must think me a brute, Jane. I haven't said a word to you about all your kindness. But, oh, you'll think me ridiculous when you know!' And she began to laugh and to sob in one breath. Stella Ballantyne had remained so sunk in apathy through all that long trial that her friends were relieved at her outburst of tears. Jane Repton led her upstairs and put her to bed just as if she had been a child. There, you can get up for dinner if you like, Stella, or stay where you are, and if you'll tell us what you want to do, we'll make the arrangements for you and not ask you a question. Jane Repton kissed her and left her alone, and it was while Stella was sleeping upstairs that Henry Thresk called at the house 
and was told that there was no news for him. No doubt she will write to you, Mr. Thresk, if she wishes you to know what she is doing. But I should not count upon it if I were you, said Jane Repton, in a sweet voice and with eyes like pebbles. She did not mention you, I am sorry to say, when the trial was over. She could not forgive him because of her own share in what she now called his treachery towards Stella. She had no more of the logician in her composition than Thresk had of the hero. He had committed, under a great stress of emotion and sympathy, what the whole experience and method of his life told him was one of the worst of crimes. And now that his object was achieved and Stella Ballantyne free, he was in the mood to see only the harm which he had done to the majesty of the law. He was uneasy. He was not troubled by the thought that discovery would absolutely ruin him. That, indeed, did not enter into his thoughts. But he could not but make a picture of himself in the robe of a king's council, claiming sternly the anger of the law against some other man who should have done just what he had done, no more and no less. And so, when Mrs. Repton's door was finally closed upon him, and no message was given to him from the woman he had saved, he was at once human and unheroic enough to visit a little of his resentment upon her. He had not spoken to her at all since the night at Chitipur. He had no knowledge of the stupor and the prostration into which, after her years of misery, she had fallen. He had no insight into the one compelling passion which now had her, body and soul, in its grip. He turned away from the door and went back to the Taj Mahal. A steamer would be starting for Port Said in two days, and by that steamer he would travel. That Stella was in the house on the Kambala Hill he did not doubt, but since she had no word or thought to spare for him, he could not but turn his back and go. Stella herself got up to dinner, and after it was over she told her friends of the longing which filled her soul. All through the trial, she said shyly, with the shrinking of those who reveal a very secret fancy, and are afraid that it will be ridiculed. In the heat of the court, in the close captivity of my cell, I was conscious of just one real, unconquerable passion, to feel the wind blowing against my face upon the Sussex Downs. Can you understand that? Just to see the broad green hills with the white chalk hollows in their sides, and the forests marching down to the valleys like the Roman soldiers from Chichester. Oh, I was mad for the look and the smell and the sounds of them. It was all that I thought about. I used to close my eyes in the dock, and I was away in a second riding through Charlton Forest, or over Farm Hill, or looking down to Slindon from Gumber Corner, and over its woods to the sea. And now that I am free, she clasped her hands and her face grew radiant, oh, I don't want to see people. She reached out a hand to each of her friends. I don't call you people, you know, but even you, you'll understand and forgive and not be hurt. I don't want to see for a little while. The beaten look of her took the sting of ingratitude out of her words. She stood between them, her delicate face worn thin, her eyes unnaturally big. She had the strange transparent beauty of people who have been lying for months in a mortal sickness. Jane Repton's eyes filled with tears, and her hands sought for her handkerchief. "'Let's see what can be done,' said Repton. "'There's a mail steamer, of course, but you won't want to travel by that.' "'No. Repton worked out the sailings from Bombay and the other ports on the western coast of India, while Stella leaned over his shoulder. "'Look,' he said, "'this is the best way. There's a steamer going to Kurichi tomorrow, and when you reach Kurichi, you'll just have time to catch a German Lloyd boat which calls at Southampton. You won't be home in thirteen days, to be sure, but on the other hand you won't be pestered by curious people.' "'Yes, yes!' cried Stella eagerly. "'I can go to-morrow.' "'Very well.' Repton looked at the clock. It was still no more than half-past ten. He saw with what a fever of impatience Stella was consumed. 
I believe I could lay my hand on the local manager of the line tonight and fix your journey up for you. You could? cried Stella. He might have been offering her a crown, so brightly her thanks shone in his eyes. I think so. He got up from the table and stood looking at her, and then away from her with his lips pursed in doubt. Yes, she said. I was thinking, will you travel under another name? I don't suggest it, really, only it might save you annoyance. Repton's hesitation was misplaced, for Stella Ballantyne's pride was quite beaten to the ground. Yes, she said at once, I should wish to do that and both he and his wife understood from that ready answer more completely than they ever had before how near Stella had come to the big blank wall at the end of life. For seven years she had held her head high, never so much as whispering a reproach against her husband, keeping with perpetual guard the secret of her misery. Pride had been her mainspring, now even that was broken. Repton went out of the house, and returned at midnight. "'It's all settled,' he said. "'You will have a cabin on deck in both steamers. I gave your name in confidence to the manager here, and he will take care that everything possible is done for you. There will be very few passengers on the German boat. The season is too early for either the tourists or the people on leave.' Thus Stella Ballantyne crept away from Bombay, and in five weeks' time she landed at Southampton. There she resumed her name. She travelled into Sussex, and stayed for a few nights at the inn whither Henry Thresk had come years before on his momentous holiday. She had a little money, the trifling income which her parents had left to her upon their death, and she began to look about for a house. By a piece of good fortune she discovered that the cottage in which she had lived at Little Beading would be empty in a few months. She took it, and before the summer was out she was once more established there. It was on an afternoon of August when Stella made her home in it again. She passed along the yellow lane, driven deep between high banks of earth, where the roots of great elm trees cropped out. Every step was familiar to her. The lane, with many twists under overarching branches, ran down a steep hill and came out into the open by the big house with its pillared portico and its light grey stone and its wonderful garden of lawn and flowers and cedars. A tiny church with a narrow graveyard and strange carefully trimmed square bushes of yew stood next to the house, and beyond the church the lane dipped to the river and the cottage. Stella went from room to room. She had furnished the cottage simply and daintily. The walls were bright. Her servant girl had gathered flowers and set them about. Outside the window the sunlight shone on a green garden. She was alone. It was the homecoming she had wished for. For three or four months she was left alone, and then one afternoon, as she came into the cottage after a walk, she found a little white card upon the table. It bore the name of Mr. Hazelwood. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 The Hazelwoods In the quiet country town, obvious changes had taken place during the eight years of Stella's absence. They were not changes of importance, however, and one sentence can symbolize them all. There was now tarmac upon its roads. But in the cluster of houses a mile away at the end of the deep lane, the case was different. Mr. Harold Hazelwood had come to Little Beading. He now lived in the big house to which the village owed its name, and indeed its existence. He lived and spread consternation amongst the gentry for miles round. "'Lord, how I wish poor Arthur hadn't died!' old John Chubble used to cry. He had hunted the West Sussex hounds for thirty years, and the very name of Little Beading turned his red face purple. There was a man. But this fellow! And to think he's got that beautiful house! Do you know there's hardly a pheasant on the place? And I've hashed them down out of the sky in the old days by the dozen.' Well, he's got a son in the coal stream, 
Dick Hazelwood, who's not so bad. But Harold, oh, pass me the port. Harold, indeed, had inherited little beading by an accident during the first summer after Stella had gone out to India. Arthur Hazelwood, the owner, and Harold's nephew, had been lost with his yacht in a gale of wind off the coast of Portugal. Arthur was a bachelor, and thus Harold Hazelwood came quite unexpectedly into the position of a country squire when he was already well on in middle age. He was a widower, and a man of a noticeable aspect. At the first glance you knew that he was not as other men. At the second you suspected that he took a pride in his dissimilarity. He was long, rather shambling in his gait, with a mild blue eye, and fair thin hair now growing grey but length was the chief impression left by his physical appearance his legs his arms his face even his hair unless his son in the coal stream happened to be at home at the time were long is your father mad mr trouble once asked of dick hazelwood the two men had met in the broad street of great beading at midday and the elder one bubbling with indignation had planted himself in front of dick mad dick repeated reflectively no i shouldn't go as far as that oh no what has he done now he has paid out of his own pocket the fines of all the people in great beading who have just been convicted for not having their babies vaccinated dick hazelwood stared in surprise at his companion's indignant face but of course he'd do that mr chubble he answered cheerfully He's anti-everything, everything, I mean, which experience has established or prudence could suggest. In addition, he wants to sell the navy for old iron and abolish the army. Uh, yes, said Dick, nodding his head amicably. He's like that. He thinks that without an army and a navy we should be less aggressive. I can't deny it. I should think not indeed, cried Mr. Trouble. Are you walking home? Yes. Let us walk together. Mr. Trouble took Dick Hazelwood by the arm, and as they went, filled the lane with his plaints. "'I should think you can't deny it. Why, he has actually written a pamphlet to enforce his views upon the subject.' "'You should bless your stars, Mr. Trouble, that there is only one. He suffers from pamphlets. He writes them and prints them, and every member of Parliament gets one of them for nothing. Pamphlets do for him what the gout does for other old gentlemen.' they carry off from his system a great number of disquieting ailments he's at prison reform now said dick with a smile of thorough enjoyment have you heard him on it no and i don't want to mr chubble exploded he struck viciously at an overhanging bough as though it were the head of harold hazelwood and went on with the catalogue of crimes he made a speech last week in the town hall and he jerked his thumb backwards towards the town they had left. Intolerable, I call it. He actually denounced his countrymen as a race of oppressors. He would, answered Dick calmly. What did I say to you a minute ago? He's advanced, you know. Advanced, sneered Mr. Trouble, and then Dick Hazelwood stopped and contemplated his companion with a thoughtful eye. "'I really don't think you understand my father, Mr. Chubble,' said Dick, with a gentle remonstrance in his voice, which Mr. Chubble was at a loss whether to take seriously or no. "'Can you give me the key to him?' he cried. "'I can. Then out with it, my lad.' Mr. Chubble disposed himself to listen, but with so bristling an expression that it was clear no explanation could satisfy him. Dick, however, took no heed of that. He spoke slowly, as one lecturing to an obtuse class of scholars. "'My father was born predestined to believe that all the people whom he knows are invariably wrong, and all the people he doesn't know are invariably right. And when I feel inclined to deplore his abuse of his own country, I console myself with the reflection that he would be the staunchest friend of England that England ever had, if only he had been born in Germany. Mr. Trouble grunted, and turned the speech suspiciously over in his mind. Was Dick poking fun at him, or his father? That's bookish, he said, 
i am afraid it is dick hazlewood agreed humbly the fact is i am now an instructor at the staff college and much is expected of me they had reached the gate of little beading house it was summer time a yellow drive of gravel ran straight between long broad flower beds to the door won't you come in and see my father dick asked innocently he's at home no my lad no mr chubble hastened to add i haven't the time but i'm very glad to have met you you are here for long no only just for luncheon said dick and he walked along the drive into the house he was met in the hall by hubbard the butler an old colourless man of genteel movements which seemed slow and were astonishingly quick he spoke in gentle purring tones and was the very butler for mr harold hazlewood your father has been asking for you sir said hubbard he seems a little anxious he is in the big room very well said dick and he crossed the hall and the drawing-room wondering what new plan for the regeneration of the world was being hatched in his father's sedulous brains he had received a telegram at camberley the day before urgently calling upon him to arrive at little beading in time for lunch he went into the library as it was called but in reality it was the room used by everybody except upon ceremonial occasions it was a big room half of it held a billiard table the other half had writing-tables lounges comfortable chairs and a table for bridge the carpet was laid over a parquet floor so that young people when they stayed there rolled it up and danced there were windows upon two sides of the room here a row of them looked down the slope of the lawn to the cedar trees and the river the other a great bay which opened to the ground gave a view of a corner of the high churchyard wall and of a meadow and a thatched cottage beyond in this bay mr hazlewood was standing when dick entered the room i got your telegram father and here i am mr hazlewood turned back from the window with a smile upon his face it is good of you richard i wanted you to-day a very genuine affection existed between these two dissimilar as they were in physique and mind dick hazlewood was at this time thirty-four years old an officer of hard work and distinction one of the younger men to whom the generals looked to provide the brains in the next great war he had the religion of his type to keep physically fit for the hardest campaigning and mentally fit for the highest problems of modern strategy and to boast about neither the one qualification nor the other these were the articles of his creed in appearance he was a little younger than his years lithe long in the leg with a thin brown face and grey eyes which twinkled with humour harold hazlewood was intensely proud of him though he professed to detest his profession and no doubt he found at times that the mere healthful well-groomed look of his son was irritatingly conventional what was quite wholesome could never be quite right in the older man's philosophy to dick on the other hand his father was an intense enjoyment here was a lovable innocent with the most delightful illusion that he understood the world dick would draw out his father by the hour but as he put it he wouldn't let the old boy down he stopped his chaff before it could begin to hurt well i am here he said what scrape have you got into now i am in no scrape richard i don't get into scrapes replied his father he shifted from one foot to the other uneasily i was wondering richard you have been away all this last year haven't you i was wondering whether you could give me any of your summer dick looked at his father what in the world was the old boy up to now he asked himself of course i can i shall get my leave in a day or two i thought of playing some polo here and there there are a few matches arranged then no doubt he broke off but look here sir you didn't send me an urgent telegram merely to ask me that no richard no everybody else called his son dick but harold hazlewood never he was richard from richard you might expect much 
the awakening of a higher nature, a devotion to the regeneration of the world, humanitarianism, even the cult of all the antis. From Dick you could expect nothing but health and cleanliness and robustious conventionality. Therefore, Richard Captain Hazelwood of the Coldstream and the Staff Corps remained. No, there was something else. Mr. Hazelwood took his son by the arm and led him into the bay window. He pointed across the field to the thatched cottage. You know who lives there? No. Mrs. Ballantyne. Dick put his head on one side and whistled softly. He knew the general tenor of that cause célèbre. Mr. Hazelwood raised remonstrating hands. There, you are like the rest, Richard. You take the worst view. Here is a good woman maligned and slandered. There is nothing against her. She was acquitted in open trial by a jury of responsible citizens under a judge of the highest court in India. Yet she is left alone, like a leper. She is the victim of gossip, and such gossip, Richard, said the old man solemnly, for uncharitableness, ill-natured, and stupid malice, the gossip of a Sussex village leaves the most deplorable efforts of Voltaire and Swift entirely behind. Father, you are going it, said Dick with a chuckle. Do you mean to give me a stepmother? I do not, Richard. Such a monstrous idea never entered my thoughts. But, my boy, I have called upon her. Oh, you have? Yes, I have seen her, too. I left a card. She left one upon me. I called again. I was fortunate. She was in? She gave me tea, Richard. Richard cocked his head on one side. What's she like, father? Topping? Richard, she gave me tea, said the old man, dwelling insistently upon his repetition. So you said, sir, and it was most kind of her to be sure. But that fact won't help me to form even the vaguest picture of her looks. But it will, Richard, Mr. Hazelwood protested, with the nervousness which set Dick wondering again. She gave me tea. Therefore, don't you see, I must return her hospitality, which I do with the utmost eagerness. Richard, I look to you to help me. We must champion that slandered lady. You will see her for yourself. She is coming here to luncheon. The truth was out at last. Yet Dick was aware that he might very easily have guessed it. This was just the quixotic line his father could have been foreseen to take. Well, we must just keep our eyes open and see that she doesn't slip anything into the decanters while our heads are turned, said Dick with a chuckle. Old Mr. Hazelwood laid a hand upon his son's shoulder. "'That's the sort of thing they say. Only you don't mean it, Richard, and they do,' he remarked with a mild and reproachful shake of the head. "'Ah, uh, some day, my boy, your better nature will awaken.' Dick expressed no anxiety for the quick advent of that day. "'How many of us are there to be at luncheon?' asked Dick. "'Only the two of us.' "'I see.' We are to keep the danger in the family. Very wise, sir, upon my word. Richard, you pervert my meaning, said Mr. Hazelwood. The neighbourhood has not been kind to Mrs. Ballantyne. She has been made to suffer. The vicar's wife, for instance, a most uncharitable person. And my sister, your Aunt Margaret, too, in great beading. She is what you would call hot stuff, murmured Dick. "'Quite so,' replied Mr. Hazelwood, and he turned to his son with a look of keen interest upon his face. "'I am not familiar with the phrase, Richard, but not for the first time I notice that the crude and inelegant vulgarisms in which you are bound and which you no doubt pick up in the barrack squares compress a great deal of forcible meaning into very few words.' "'That is indeed true, sir,' replied Dick, with an admirable gravity. "'And, if I might be allowed to suggest it, a pamphlet upon that interesting subject would be less dangerous work than coquetting with the latest edition of the Marquise de Brinvilliers.' The word pamphlet was a bugle call to Mr. Hazelwood. "'Ah, speaking of pamphlets, my boy,' he began, 
and walked over to a desk which was littered with papers. "'We have not the time, sir,' Dick interrupted from the bay of the window. A woman had come out of the cottage. She unlatched a little gate in her garden, which opened onto the meadow. She crossed it. Yet another gate gave her entrance to the garden of little beading. In a moment Hubbard announced, "'Mrs. Ballantyne,' and Stella came into the room and stood near to the door, with a certain constraint in her attitude and a timid watchfulness in her big eyes. She had the look of a deer. It seemed to Dick that at one abrupt movement she would turn and run. Mr. Hazelwood pressed forward to greet her, and she smiled with a warmth of gratitude. Dick, watching her from the bay window, was surprised by the delicacy of her face, by a look of fragility. She was dressed very simply in a coat and short skirt of white, her shoes and her gloves were of white suede, her hat was small. "'And this is my son Richard,' said Mr. Hazelwood, and Dick came forward out of the bay. Stella Ballantyne bowed to him, but said no word. She was taking no risks, even at the hands of the son of her friend. If advances of friendliness were to be made, they must be made by him, not her. There was just one awkward moment of hesitation. Then Dick Hazelwood held out his hand. "'I am very glad to meet you, Mrs. Ballantyne,' he said cordially, and he saw the blood rush into her face and the fear die out in her eyes. The neighbourhood, to quote Mr. Hazelwood, had not been kind to Stella Ballantyne. She had stood in the dock, and the fact tarnished her. Moreover, here and there letters had come from India. The verdict was inevitable, but there was a doubt about its justice. The full penalty, no. No one desired or would have thought it right, but something betwixt and between and the proper spirit of British compromise would not have been amiss. Thus gossip ran. Moreover, Stella Ballantyne was too good-looking, and she wore her neat and simple clothes too well. To some of the women it was an added offence, when they considered what she might be wearing if only the verdict had been different. Thus, for a year, Stella had been left to her own company, except for a couple of visits which the Reptons had paid to her. At the first she had welcomed the silence, the peace of her loneliness. It was a balm to her. She recovered like a flower in the night. But she was young, she was twenty-eight this year, and as her limbs ceased to be things of lead, and became once more aglow with life, there came to her a need of companionship. She tried to tramp the need away on the turf of her well-loved downs, but she failed. A friend to share with her the joy of these summer days. Her blood clamoured for one. But she was an outcast. Friends did not come her way. Therefore she had gratefully received old Mr. Hazelwood in her house, and had accepted, though with some fear, his proposal that they should lunch at the big house and make the acquaintance of his son. She was nervous at the beginning of that meal, but both father and son were at the pains to put her at her ease, and soon she was talking naturally, with a colour in her cheeks, and now and then a note of laughter in her voice. Dick worked for the recurrence of that laughter. He liked the clear sound of it, and the melting of all her face into sweetness and tender humour which came with it. And for another thing he had a thought, and a true one, that it was very long since she had known the pleasure of good laughter. They took their coffee out on the lawn under the shade of a huge cedar tree. The river ran at their feet, and a Canadian canoe and a rowing boat were tethered close by in a little dock. The house, a place of grey stone, with grey weathered and lichen-coloured slates, raised its great oblong chimneys into a pellucid air. The sunlight flashed upon its rows of tall windows. They were all flat to the house, except the one great bay on the ground floor in the library, and birds called from all the trees. The time slipped away. Dick Hazelwood found himself talking of his work, a practice into which he seldom fell, and was surprised that she could talk of it with him. He realized with a start how it was that she knew. But she talked naturally and openly, as though he must know her history. Once even some jargon of the staff college slipped from her. 
you were doing let us pretend at box hill last week weren't you she said and when he started at the phrase she imagined that he started at the extent of her information it was in the papers she said i read every word of them and then for a second her face clouded and she added i have time you see she looked at her watch and sprang to her feet i must go she said i didn't know it was so late i have enjoyed myself very much she did not hesitate now to offer her hand good-bye dick hazlewood went with her as far as the gate and came back to his father you were asking me he said carelessly if i could give you some part of the summer i don't see why i couldn't come here in a day or two the polo matches aren't so important the old man's eyes brightened i shall be delighted richard if you will he looked at his son with something really ecstatic in his expression at last then his better nature was awakening i really believe he exclaimed and dick cut him short yes it may be that sir on the other hand it may not what is quite clear is that i must catch my train so if i might order the car of course of course he came out with his son into the porch of the house we have done a fine thing to-day richard he said with enthusiasm and a nod towards the cottage beyond the meadow we have indeed sir returned dick cheerily did you ever see such a pair of ankles she lost the tragic look this afternoon richard we must be her champions we will put in the summer that way father said dick and waving his hand was driven off to the station mr hazlewood walked back to the library but walked is a poor word he seemed to float on air a great opportunity had come to him he had enlisted the services of his son he saw dick and himself as toreadors waving red flags in the face of a bull labelled conventionality he went back to the pamphlet on which he was engaged with renewed ardour and laboured diligently far into the night End of chapter 14